Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. session of the 2023 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are pleased to introduce the presentation, A Viewer Panel. And our panelists are um, myself and uh, Joe Magarak and Mal Burns and Robert Adams. Joe Magarak is the inventor of the Ragdoll Physics, the MSCS, Stanford and the Nagel algorithm in TCP in Silicon Valley. Mr. Blue, uh, Robert Adams, has been a com computer developer and researcher for 40 years and is one of our OpenSim core developers. Mal Burns is host of InWorld Review, a weekly news and discussion program mostly focused on the hypergrid, which has been running for over 15 years. He is now retired and uses his experience to deploy and promote immersive spaces and to support BulletSim. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimilar.org for speaker bios, details of the sessions, and the full schedule of events. This session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag pound. OSCC 23. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session now. Well, thank you, Leo, thank and you. Uh, good to be back here. I'm looking out on the crowd here by my camera and seeing quite a few people. So good to have, uh, good to see you all back here. I uh, hope you had a good lunch, unless you were gabbing away in the developers. <laughs> session. Right. Um, okay. Um, this is uh, what well, sort of come to call the return of the viewer panel. I, I'm not sure we really had one last year, but it's the kind of thing we've been holding every year at about this time on Saturday, just looking at new developments in both viewer technology and the particular viewers uh, we run with, and of course, where appropriate, uh, this, as this year, with the, um, the devs who are an integral sort of part of um, that equation. Um, so, um, without further ado, I'd just like to... Oh, firstly, I would, um, you, if you see the slide behind us, you'll see mention of somebody called Gavin Hurd. He's not actually with us, unfortunately, but we do uh, have Joe um, Magarak and Robert Adams. So, um, let me... Um, I know Leah's done a very good job anyway, but maybe Joe and Robert, starting with Joe, I will hand over to you for a second just to introduce yourselves and your involvement, so to speak. Joe, maybe first. Ah, maybe you need to unmute. Okay, maybe I'll move to Robert instead then. I can see his mic's off. <laughs> well, my mic's on, yes. Yeah. So, um, I made my first commit to Open Simulator in 2010, and I was a, have been been an active core developer for a long time in OpenSim, so I, I'm... Um, known for doing bullet sim, adding var regions, and the distributed scene graph code, and lots of other tweaking. Um, after a while, I went rogue and wrote things like Convor, which is an OR to GLTF scene converter. Um, as I went uh, uh, looking at other uh, different systems, uh, I have, in the last few years, like written the grid directory server for the high fidelity client sources that are currently used in the Vercadia and the Overte projects. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, about a year ago, I presented at OSCC uh, my Basil viewer project, where I was trying to build a viewer um, uh, using an, uh, creating a new protocol. So it was tr tru truly going rogue. Um, so I presented that last year. And then recently I've been uh, tweaking on BulletSim for um, uh, users who had needed that. Um, and so I've been in OpenSim and virtual worlds for a while. Yes, very familiar. Um, Joe, do we have you on mic yet? Yes. Uh, am I coming through? Uh, yeah, you're coming through fine. So maybe like a, a quick self-intro from you. Okay. Um, after a few years of using Second Life and a little bit of Open Simulator, I was sort of annoyed that viewer problems weren't being fixed. And I thought, I will write my own viewer from scratch in Rust. Right. And three years in, <laughs> I have something that can actually be tried, although there's an awful lot it doesn't do yet. 
Uh, I was trying to figure out, my basic goal is, can we get to the level, performance level of GTA 5, not GTA 6, GTA 5, which is 10 years old, assuming that you're running on a gamer PC, a gamer PC being roughly what the average Steam user has? And the answer is you can definitely get there, but boy, is it a lot of work. Right, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with some of these technical terms, but I'm sure we'll, we'll sort them out. Uh, so, in a, in a way, you're both, um, you're both, uh, what's the word, um, out, out Oh, yes, Grand Theft Auto is GTA, yes. Uh, yeah, you're both, so you're both um, outliers, so to speak, verging from, um, you know, the, the core devs um, in a lot of what you do. Now, um, we're, we're entering somewhat very uncertain times. I've been inundated by conversations about this recently. Uh, including earlier, um, <clears throat> the um, we have to look at the. I mean, the viewer is obviously an essential part of the open sim experience. You can't divorce the viewer from the open sim, you know, code. Uh, you anyway, you can't divorce the um, uh, the server functions from the local functions. They all kind of interact to some extent. So um, I know I'm going to hand over to Leah for a little bit because I know that um, she's been picking up um, on a number of things that th she thinks or other people think could really affect uh, the future, uh, particularly of the viewer. And um, that's particularly why we decided to co-host this year's panel. So maybe I can hand over to you, Leah. Thank you, Mel. And by the way, we did have a couple of questions from the audience, too. Oh, um, yes. Do, do send them yeah. in. <laughs> sure, sure. And um, I'll, I'll let our panelists think about those questions as we move into the first topic. The, the questions, by the way, are, uh, are we thinking about supporting VR headgear at some point? And then what about mobile devices? You know, uh, Linda Lab has been talking for a long time about mobile support. And of course, people were thinking it would come out by Christmas. Christmas and and it hasn't and <laughs> and of course there's a lot going on there um, so uh, but the, that wasn't really the primary yeah. question I had for you my first thought I would, uh, was I just um, interrupt there just to give my thoughts on the first question what is yeah, in, sure. fresh in our mind yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a depend you know um, obviously it's not necessarily a dev thing but it's obviously something that developers uh, w would presumably bear in mind and that is the end user. Um, the <clears throat> I call it helmet land, <laughs> and but also the mobile phone too. These are utilities we use in our interconnected world. You know, if I want to open up uh, a chat with somebody, be maybe it's um, um, a chat in an open sync grid or in Second Life or whatever. I like the idea that I can open up that chat on my phone. But um, unless you've got one of these dedicated like Steam things or whatever, the idea of actually immersing yourself in a small screen seems to me to be a bit of a wild ghost chase. And you mentioned High Fidelity earlier, for example. I know uh, Rosell sort of, um, he, he more or less gave up on that. He still controls the audio compression stuff. But um, it's like the time wasn't right for the helmets really. They are a particular thing. You might have something like, you know, a scientist, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, may want to wear a helmet, not because he wants to wear it for six hours in his lab, but because it's a better implement for what he does than the microscope. He can render virtually in a helmet far more detail than he can get looking through his microscope. But even if he goes to the microscope, he's not going to be doing it for six hours a day. You know, he's going to go to the microscope when he's ready. And I think helmet land is really that sort of thing. And also, I, I can preempt our, our dev answers with the fact that um, Second Life and Open Sim, um, it is a fully 3D world, but it really is not compatible with the requirements, uh, the engine, as it were, that you need the platform to be on to actually work properly in a helmet. Um, so <laughs> I'll hand back to Leah for the second question, and I won't interrupt again. <laughs> well, I can, I can, oh, yeah. I can, I can give my view on that. I mean, since sure. you uh, not only your view, um, I mean, I see, I see social interaction as a kind of continuum, and the continuum comes from sometimes you want a 
a presence. That is, you want to be in the same room with people. You want a presence. And, uh, you know, the headset does does that well, and uh, the desktop 3D experience does that well. But as you move away from the presence, that is, things you need to do because you're, you want to be there with people, you get to uh, text chat. And text chat is, is less intimate, but it's still um, communicating. And then you want to do uh, store and forward uh, messaging like mail or Twitter or something like that, which is less immediate, but is still communicating. And I think that the, um, uh, the social experience should be built that way. That is, sometimes you want to be there. And, you know, if people want to be there on their phones, you know, where they're looking at this little screen and they can see the other people, that is part of the whole experience that um, they, um, uh, you know, want to partake in. And so I, I see that, you know, we're providing tools to the sort of connectivity that people want with other people and that it can range from the headset where you you know, are really experiencing the 3D thing to that little screen on your phone. And it just depends on the use usage that people need to communicate. I would tend to very much agree there. Utility, really. Um, your thoughts on this, Joe? Uh, Joe, unmuted. <laughs> Did someone address me? Yes, I just see your thoughts on the question. Um... Well, since I have to have to make it work technically and probably don't have the time, um, I am somewhat negative on supporting VR headgear. There's a lot of stuff you have to do. Um, I mean, there are lots of social issues, and I would look at what's happening over in the VR chat land. And as I typed in text, watch Fia's The Virtual Reality Show. Fia has been using VR since she was 17 or so, and is a VR native, and is very comfortable wearing... VR gear to the point of even trying sleeping in VR gear. Yes. This is a thing in VR chat. People will go to bed in full VR gear, and in world, there's a group of people sitting there lying on the floor on a big bed, um, not really doing anything. And people find this comforting. So, um, I did, I did, um, I, I ran the AFRID on my show a couple of weeks ago. There was somebody manufacturing a helmet where, and a software to go with it, is, which is designed for exactly that. It's headgear for the bed. <laughs> you know, what next, I said. But, yeah, I, I can quite believe that. The question the downside surely, of oh. full immersion is the, the oh. risk of falling down is high. Um, yeah. About 5 to 10% of the population will barf. Um, and you can't do anything else while you're using it. Yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah. Also, to my mind, and I, I wonder how important this is, I think it may be, and that is um, full immersion is what it implies. In other words, it, it feeds you smells maybe and taste and vision and sound and everything else. But the problem is, if you get full immersion to that degree, you've actually cut yourself off from the real world, the organic world. You know, if you're immersed in sound, like, you know, old-fashioned music headphones, you don't necessarily hear people moving around by you. If you've got a helmet on, a headset of some sort, you can't see if somebody's going to come in through the window and nick something. <laughs> and um, very much eventually they're speculating that, you know, like 3D printing, we can use substrates of some sort, like aromatherapy oils, where... You'll put three in, a, you know, like a printer, three inks for aromatherapy, and they'll they'll be able to mix up any scent you want with those three primary oils. And so you'll have a headset which also has a nose attachment. And who knows when the taste attachment comes? I don't know. I don't know. I suspect all these things will be invented, but the question is how, how much do we really want to, you know, go with that? Yeah. But uh, to come back to the question, I mean, I know there is a... And there's somebody, I don't think it's one of you, that actually does do a sort of 3D um, viewer for Second Life and OpenSim. Control-Alt-something, I think it's called. Does anybody know? 
uh, it mimics the um, experience of um, you know using say um, open sim or second life in in uh, in a helmet. Uh, but of course, the the physics, the, the the whole engine and stuff are not really meant for that. Um, uh, it seems to me to be a rather different experience. For, you know, um, if you're lucky enough to have a, a helmet world that, where people have legs, <laughs> I think most so, do now. Um, so, you know, so, they, they, don't, uh, they don't work so, the same way as we yeah, do. It. So, uh, James, what would it take to make your viewer all the way? Sorry, um, who said that? Um, how do you mean all the way? Well, I mean, there's no there seem to be several viewers that are uh, fifty percent plus complete. Um, oh. How can we get one of them to a hundred percent? Good, good question. Money. You... That Joe? question's for Joe, and he says money. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> is yes. That what it is? Uh, yes, it's. Um... Well, inevitably, yes, yeah, funding for, for, for anything and everything. Well, really. and, and that's what's true of the... Uh, I've been um, lurking around the Crystal Frost Project, which is a, yeah. a viewer that uses live metaverse and um, Unity. And essentially, the main developers have a job. You know, they have to pay rent. And so they don't have much time or focus on the the viewer to actually work, you know, to be able to do it. And uh, they have a Patreon and it brings in a few bucks, but they really can't get it all the way to 100% because they have a life. Yes, of course. And has anybody got any ideas about how possibly uh, funding for development on at least on an acceptable scale might be achieved. I know that I know, for example, we've had this discussion in the past and a lot of the core devs, I, th I guess they just reluctant to give up their independence. Um, you know, they don't want to be <laughs> employed by somebody who maybe by paying them dictates what's happening. Um, you know, so I know there's a bit of hostility there, but then again, without that um, kind of uh, one individual may be dusting it as a hobby. They may even be able to do it full time without being paid. But others, that's not the case for everybody, of course. Um, so, is the can you either of you particularly think of any way that your time could be remunerated? Um, you know, in ways that it isn't at the moment. Oh, deathly silence rules here, I see. <laughs> so you're asking okay. them if they can find a funding source themselves? Or what do you, what do you mean there? No, I, uh, yeah, well, I suppose I am in a way. I'm actually suggesting that uh, any suggestions that you might be looking for um, are, are not so much needing funding, but any particular funding sources that you think would be worth approaching, either yourself or as a group. Um, well, just... I mean, given that it's an open source project and that there are lots of users, yeah. you know, it's the usual thing of if everybody put in five bucks, there would be a lot of a lot of money. Um, you know, but how to organize that, you know, and, and, you know, there were in the early days of OpenSim, there were a bunch of corporations, uh, IBM and Intel and... Uh, even Linden Labs, was helping yeah. the open source community uh, build out the virtual world and support people working on it. Um, but that doesn't seem to be as big a thing now. Um, so... Um, it was... Um, it's funny. At the time, uh, I guess Rosedale was still CEO. I mean, he said to me that there just wasn't enough people on OpenSyn to be worth doing that. Now, I think they probably take the opposite approach, but their concerns have changed. They're more concerned about um, protecting inventory and things. Although, to be honest, having an export function would benefit creators in Second Life if they could sell to OpenSim, for example. But the issue then, people say, well, what's to stop the copy bots working? And, you know, people already go to um, take stuff out one way or another, of, um, SL and bring it in here. Well, and, and that's another question that I kind of have is that um, 
the reason to work on an open sim viewer is to support the open sim community yeah. i mean we we're, we're a certain niche i mean there's the vr chat and there's the minecraft people and there's the um uh, you know there, there are so many virtual worlds out there now that you know everyone has a few thousand people in them at least and um open sim is its own particular community and yeah. the reason to make a viewer is to support and uh, help that open source um, community. I mean, one reason yeah. OpenSim exists is because it is open source and people can hack on it. They can't hack on VR chat. They can't hack on yeah. uh, Second Life. They can't, you know, this is, this is uh, in the community so people can do research and do education and uh, build their things. So we want to support this community um so you know do we really want you know how best to support this particular community we don't have to solve the virtual world in general problem we have to solve how to um, support our community and you know in some sense it could be that if everyone gave up on their viewers and focused everything on firestorm or yeah. day turn or one you know one of the viewers um that that would that could be enough. I see. Say uh, five dollars. What did you say a month or we a year or something? <laughs> it doesn't sound like. I just, very, made, a, I just made up a number. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound like very much. It's a matter of it, it, was, it is organizing, of course, but it's actually um, convincing people that uh, five dollars is a um, yeah. power or whatever um, serves its purpose. I mean, but I mean, maybe we need, maybe we need our our own our own. Only fans channel, so yeah. everyone gives their ten dollars, and so we have a million dollars, and that works out. There is one thing uh, that occurred to me recently, and I've been repeating it all over the place actually, um, because it hadn't um, occurred to me until a few weeks ago. And that is, you know, we've had this, everybody and their dog has got a metaverse of their own now, so the idea of an interconnected metaverse is way gone, you know, but uh, all the misinterpretations and everything now. Everybody wants, you know, they oh, we want it decentralized, but um, we want to be the centralized controller of the decentralized world, you know, just total blind <laughs> sort of what they want. But I did notice one thing of all these worlds that have been coming and going, and really, some of them have a tiny viewers, they just make out they got lots. Only Second Life, and more importantly, Open Sim have had, had one aspect of that that none of the other worlds have got. And that is the immediacy of collaboration. I can res a brim, I can give you permissions, you can reshape it, I can give somebody else permissions, so they can texture it. People can work together, not just having a meeting, but actually semi-physically, you know, working with our prim assets or whatever. You can't do it with mesh, but you can with the, the prim stuff. And none of the other worlds, they, they all involve going into Unity and building your landscape and then importing it or using other in-world tools, but it's, it doesn't happen in real time. You've got to go away, create, bring it in. And we have a viewer, but not to mention the platform, second, I have to include Second Life with OpenSim, but we have a platform and a viewer system that allows us to just do things totally immediately with other people. We're not just meeting them, um, collaborating, going to concerts, having meetings or whatever. We can actually build together. The sculptor can take the brim and then the artist can texture it and things and all sorts of different things can come into play. But of course, if you're uh, going on what you're saying, Robert, if we're going to pitch the client as it being a particular thing, I kind of wonder if that central thing that nobody else has replicated, except Second Life, of course, might be the thing to concentrate on. But, you know, we're developing a viewer for a world where you can do stuff in real real time, not just import a mesh. How do you feel about that, Joe? <laughs> for example? Joe? Oh, um... Well, we're less real time than we would like to be because we don't really have good in-world building. We had that with Prims, but you couldn't do that much. Once people had to use Blender, it just became too complicated for 95% of the user base. Yeah. 
You know, on that note, I'm going to chime in because I, I teach, uh, as you know, 60 uh, classes here in, in the virtual world. And in every class, my, my students create projects. And the reason they do is because uh, the power of creation is powerful for idea generation and for synthesis of, of the concepts that we're exploring. And they're not mesh developers and they don't use Blender. In fact, we're in a totally different discipline, so they're focusing on different kinds of problems but uh, being able to design and simulate even prim-based designs and to create content and to shape it into experiences uh, the virtual world's an aggregator of so many technologies they can weave and, and blend so much in here that it creates something very powerful we put it on resers we take it to conferences we use it as experiences and and students really connect with that it transforms them. It does something that Otto Scharmer from the MIT Presencing Institute calls this uh, social interaction that's so critical to understanding, you know, and, and experiencing um, and remembering uh, over time. You know, we try to remember 75 to 90% of what we do so that uh, we can use this and apply this in new problems, new situations. So my point from my perspective the viewer is critical because it empowers us to get our work done. It empowers us to, um, uh, you know, not only navigate, communicate, and interact with objects, but to be a creator. And that creation is the powerful difference between my work in VR with students and my work in virtual worlds with students. Fascinating. I know it was a little, little uh, <laughs> heavy, but it's just the no, notion. No, I, I am so thankful to the viewer developers because without them, I wouldn't be able to do all that. <laughs> and uh, that the, uh, I mean, I'm fascinated. I can completely see that, but also in a way, you're reiterating the sort of uh, limited use for the helmet thing. How are you? You can. Well, you I've been studying head-mounted display devices, you know, since 95, Mal. You know, yeah. I did research in it and for usability, for new user interface paradigms, for rethinking how we use technology and what it is that magic that the immersive experience gives us, how that transforms and correlates to what we do here in these 3D worlds. And, you know, you can simulate immersion in many different ways. The question is, do you have to have it all centered around your body in such a way that you must wear this device that truly yeah. makes you a little bit uncomfortable? After using head-mounted display devices for over well, 27 years, <laughs> I can tell you right now that no matter how much money I throw at the problem, at some point there will be discomfort those deleterious side effects that Joe and Mr. Blue talk about and the mm -hmm. use cases for how important it is that we feel comfortable, we have a sense of presence and awareness of others. See, in VR, I cannot see myself, even if I could see my yeah. hands or my upper torso, it's not the same, you know? Yeah. I don't have that same deep immersion when it comes to sense of self. And oddly enough, you know, in the early years, I didn't focus on identity creation with classes. We we were all business, right? And then I learned that people cannot learn comfortably if they're not aware of themselves and how others see themselves and experience them. And so uh, we have to devote some time to identity definition and creation. Yeah, I think we have to recognize we're at a point in time where we uh, some things need to improve, but other things actually don't they're good the way they are despite the limitations i mean oh yeah one, one of the helmet manufacturers and uh, oh and of course the the apple one when it can the thing comes out you know it's got a system where it can project onto the what is normally hidden the screen you can see the screen inside but they can see your likeness on the outside whether it's a, a true likeness or not um i'm not quite sure but apparently that's not going down too well because that seemed to be Apple's idea was that the helmet itself will have a projection of your face on it, which will therefore <laughs> increase your presence. But in fact, you don't really need it um, for most things. You know, you just, it's like a big screen thing. You just pull out everything and they surround you. But why? Why can't you, what will you be able to do with that device that you can't already do with like having two monitors or three monitors, which is extreme, but it's, you know, <laughs> you don't, 
you just don't need that device, I, I think. Um, there, well, I've got, um, you said there was another question, or probably by now, quite a few questions from the audience. We better have Well, the other, the other but, uh, part the other, was Lisa's sorry, question sorry, of sorry, mobile. Sorry, yeah, go sorry, right Robert, ahead, Joe. Robert, but nothing is no, it was, it was Robert. Oh, Robert? It was mentioning hey, Robert. the, the um, I guess something I hadn't mentioned before is one of the reasons that people want to build a new viewer is to have control over the UI. Yeah. And that oh. your comments about building and interaction and that sort of stuff, I think a lot of people have a lot of ideas about how the user interface should be. And what Linden Lab is giving us is not everyone's dream. Um, and so if we had an open source viewer, then people could do more with the, the, the user interface to the virtual world. And I think there's a lot of um, interesting work that could be done there. There's a very, um, I, th I think Linda now has really messed up, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago when they, they first brought the new, so-called new viewer in and they had a thing that slid in at the side and <laughs> everybody hated it. And actually, uh, the current viewers still have a bit of that as legacy, but not all of it. But something I do, and I think uh, to your point, um, Robert, is, um, is, is an example of that, I think. I can actually... Um, that's a prim in world and I flatten it out and make it into the shape of say, you know, a chat window. And then um on the media of a prim um surface, um I put something like um the, the the mobile version of Telegram. And then I wear it as a HUD. So it's something I'm doing in the viewer with the server side prims and media on the prim, but I create my own chat window window to Telegram that I just wear as a HUD in world. Because it's using the web, <laughs> the web link to put media on the brim. So it's an example of devious ways one can get around these things if one wants. But I think I understand what you mean. It, wouldn't it be easier if we had a drag and drop system to drag and drop a pallet or um, a window that you know, um, especially for connectivity with? Um, there used to be a, um, a thing in OpenSIM that allowed you to chat with people in Second Life. You had to have this particular widget in both platforms. There was a version for both, but once you were wearing it, you could access, you know, anybody wearing it could access their friends in either platform, as it were. Um, I don't think much came of that, but it's another example of it's a, a stealth way of getting around the interoperability thing. So the more a viewer, as you say, can include those things, I would think the better. Uh, that might be another way to, uh, to go. Uh, it also depends, of course, on how much, which both of you maybe have a, a thoughts on, how much is going to be client side and how much is going to be serv server side. At the moment, we've got this balance. Um, you know, we, when it comes to speed and moving around and doing things, we're relying on the ability client side that we have with the computer we're using or whatever. But when it comes to a lot of communication tools and stuff that need to go up and down, then we're relying on what there is server side. Is there anything, for example, that is currently server side that could be offset um, to client side to improve, speed things up, for example? Uh, both of you on that, maybe. Robert's well, lots again. of things. Lots of things. Um, uh, I think, I mean, architecturally, I mean, one of the things I tried, tried to play with in Bazel uh, was splitting the rendering functions from the world functions. But uh, that's a difficult problem because some world functions you need to have real close to the renderer. Like, you know, you're in your uh, 3D virtual world thing and you touch your, uh, your wrist device and a screen shows up so that you can change settings. Uh, that can't be on the server side. That has to be as close to the rendering engine as possible. Of course. Um, there are, exist, uh, are new technologies that can be used to, I guess, bridge that gap to allow things to be pushed towards the renderer or maybe towards the server. Um, I personally like web assembly, but that's um, just a technical detail. So, I mean, I think if we really... If someone wanted to rethink the viewer and be able to separate the rendering engine, you know, whether it be Unity or Godot or or uh, uh, whatever, uh, from the world logic, um, uh, 
a, a system of being able to do that because really what happens is viewers tend to become monolithic because uh, like you say, there's this question of what has to be uh, close to the renderer that is really specific to the particular world that you're viewing at, and that just tends to to draw things closer together so it becomes one monolithic program so that the, uh, the world code can talk directly to the renderer. Um, but I think architecturally there's some interesting directions to, to go in there. Um, and, and I think the technology exists. Uh, again, it's just um, uh, a bunch of work. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Some um, separation of client server side ideas? Well, that doesn't really reflect on how viewers work internally. The renderer is not really that big of an issue. The keeping the model of the world that the viewer has in sync with the model of the world that the simulator side has is actually most of the effort. Um, and that's where the network bandwidth goes. Right. And where we are, where we want to do things locally, the main problem is that um, you can only do things locally if they only affect the uh, local user. That is, if you're going to touch your watch and have something pop up, do other people get to see that happen when you do it? If so, it has to go through the server. Of course, yeah. Yes, uh, the the mechanics of how it works is uh, fairly obvious, but I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, well, that process of touching your watch and the other person standing next to you see you do it, that means it's got to go up, info's got to go to the server and come back down in as real, near as real time as possible. But well, yeah, but the, are, the, are late, the, latency, the latency questions are different. But yeah, yes. and are there any tricks that speed up that yeah. sort of uh, process? Okay, the one other thing that comes up to mind, the elephant in the room, we haven't got around to discussing it here yet, and that is uh, the almighty AI <laughs> lurking on the horizon. Now, um, well, we, we had um, a, a, a lone wolf this morning mentioning, um, you know, the way you can use... Uh, oh, actually, well, it's not mesh, but you can get the AI to actually to generate giant terrains for him and things like that. But my thought here, I mean, um, I've been talking to a lot of people about this, you know, it's, it's going to affect almost everything we do and, you know, how much so is, we, we, you know, we've got to handle it with a certain amount of conscience and wariness. But um, I think one well, of the first things it did, of course, was you ask it a question, it gives you a reply based on sourcing every possible answer from everywhere and presumably estimating the best answer. But could, could what well, we know already, it can be used to create code. And as a utility for a, a developer, could um, do you think there's any to be gained in the future where, you know, instead of, doing a lot of hand coding that I know you guys would probably have to do at the moment. Do you see AI being a partner in making that process quicker? Um, or do you really think it could even mess things up and make it worse? I mean, uh, people have mixed views on this, but I'm trying to think of it in terms of, you know, coding. But be a, a viewer particularly, but, you know, the server side stuff that goes with it. Is it something we should dread or do you see possibilities there for improving things and possibly cutting you know cut, cutting time to do things which as you say costs money joe can go first on this one if you I've got you well um i expect that large language models will take over coding typical web type interfaces over the next year or two yeah. um because those are pretty standardized and there's a lot of training data for them to look at. It doesn't help too much with things which are fairly close to being unique, such as you know, the, the interior or something like Open Simulator. There aren't a hundred things like it you can look at and borrow from, which is basically how LLMs work. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yes, by starving by starving them of information, we can restrict what they do. Uh, Robert, your thoughts on that? Well, um, I mean, there are lots of new tools. Um, I don't don't write in assembly code anymore. Um, I write in higher level languages, and now I wouldn't uh, uh, 
try writing in higher level languages without an IDE, and I've gotten pretty used to Copilot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I expect the tool environment is just going to get richer. Um, you know, I mean, uh, Joe mentioned the, the problem of synchronization protocols. Yeah. Um, you know, an artificially intelligent synchronization protocol I could understand happening, you know, that adapts and learns and does the right thing to uh, make the best synchronization performance in a particular situation. Um, and I expect those to come and happen. Um, and uh, I think it'll make things easier and better and faster. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it swings around about it, isn't it, on that point. We'll have to wait and see because it, it's the biggest thing and it's tremendous, but it's still early days and it's developing at the speed of light, you know. Nothing nothing has, you know, developed at that, the kind of speed that this is happening, I've got to admit. Okay, um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to head back to Leah on the question front. Have we got any new questions or any you forgot to give us? Well, I had heard, and of course this might be just a rumor, maybe, but I remember in one of the core dev meetings, someone bringing up the the thought that the um, Firestorm Mac um, viewer might be going offline. There might not be support for it. So we were wondering what are the implications there? And I do want to let the audience know that Gavin Hurd was invited to the panel, but had a had a conflict. And he has been working on an update to the day turn viewer for the Mac users. So he did have a commit that uh, uh, was posted. I don't know what the current state is of that, but we're very interested in our Mac community having support also, right? And Absolutely. so, um, so I wanted to ask the viewers what they thought about this, and and. Uh, where where they think we're going. Maybe they know more about it than I do. Actually, while I'm at it, and you'll be able to monitor this better than me, I think, Lyra, uh, um, those of you in the audience, in text chat, um, just type yes if you use a Mac to access virtual worlds, just so we get a, an idea of um, the number of you. So let's see lots of yeses, or maybe none, as the case may be. <laughs> um, I don't know if that matter, but it seems that the map may be the biggest problem here. Cherry says no, for example. Siri says Siri yes. says yes. Um, yeah. I know in our group, we're using Mac servers, but let's face it, we're running Linux. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> yep. you, might, you can think of them as the same thing on certain levels. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How about your yeah. users, Kay? Do you ever get any Mac, Mac users from school? From your schools, no. So maybe, maybe I Firestorm's see. decision to stop supporting the Mac uh, viewer is based on the fact that they just don't get a lot of downloads, right? Well, no, I heard earlier. Was it? Wasn't it? It was either here or immediately before we came here in the dev chat. Um, the um, basically they don't have a person. Uh, There's or they, that. They have True. One person who can handle the Mac code. It's rather like uh, Jessica always says to me when it comes to firestorms. So, the, you know, um, I, I've got 80 people working with me. Only one of them is remotely interested in open sim, and that's me. <laughs> you know, was her whole team of 80 are really, you know, they're not paid. They're volunteers, so they really do what they want, and they're all developing for um, Second Life, basically. <laughs> And so, you know, there's only one person there. And it sounds to me that this is a similar case with the, the Mac thing. They they go drop the Mac client. Presumably, they're talking to the Mac client on both platforms, Second Life and... Well, uh, and, and the Mac environment, I mean, they're kind of ahead of everybody else in that, you know, like I'm building bullet sim binaries for OpenSim, and the Mac stuff has to be taken separately and built on a machine and signed on that same machine in order to be able to be run in the Mac environment. Um, that is coming to the Windows environment. You, you know, now you try to download binaries and uh, the Windows system says, no, you don't, this isn't signed, this isn't certified. Right. Um, and so it's just going to get harder over harder for us distributors who are, you know, compiling and distributing things uh, to adapt to these environments. And so I can see that, you know, 
the Mac environment is a little harder now in that you have to have somebody who has a developer's license and signs the binaries. Um, and that'll happen on Windows before before our, our lifetimes. To, to what extent do um, developers say um, also something for Windows and um, stand alone and it, it can then be rebuilt for the Mac without starting from square one? Or do you really have to start from square one for those platforms? No, it, it is pretty straightforward. I mean, they do build... I mean, I do build Bullet Sim for the Mac along with everything else. It's just uh, uh, that I can't do the signing step because I'm not a Mac developer. Oh, and, you know, there'll be little differences that a Mac person would know that a Windows person wouldn't know, for instance. Yeah. Shame, really. Uh, right, any other questions from the audience today? We're really coming to an end here, so they'd have to be very personal intelligent questions if we have any. Well, why don't we ask end on this note? What yeah. is your wish list for the future? What would you like to see possible? Now, I know money, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <I was> saying. <laughs> but in addition to money, what are the resources and things you need from the community to make your work stronger? Me? Mr. Blue, or I the Rust was... environment to get their act together. Okay, there you go. So, so the technology you're writing in and, and uh, architecting for, you need them to to make more decisions, come out with better releases, or interfaces. What else? Well, the real problem is I'm doing everything in Rust, and I'm using a graphics stack which uses something called Ren3 and WGPU and Vulkan. And of those, only Vulkan is well supported. Um, WGPU has about five or six developers, and Ren3 has only one, really. And he, he went off and got married. Oh, no. That's the end of everything, isn't it? Productivity <laughs> is way down. <laughs> yeah. So um, anything else on that, Robert? No, I don't. I don't think so. I'm, I'm not working on. Uh, I'm just helping some of the viewer projects, and probably uh, some of the viewer projects um, could use more help. And um, I guess I have a I have a few ergs that I can give to help viewers. I have one final question then for me, actually. Um, that is, uh, what was the um, oh, I forget his name, Clark, J J C Clark. Uh, the, the, the early days, there was Uvea, wasn't there? And there was the early versions of OpenSim. Um, the, the, I, uh, Leah, you must know. Uh, Jason, uh, Casey, oh. there was one per central person. You're thinking he, of Justin Clark Casey. Justin Clark Casey. Casey Clark, Clark, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, my, uh, you know, so yeah, geriatric memory job there. Right, <laughs> Justin. Um, there was a real ripple when he left because he, he not only spoke in the layman's language about things, which helped, but um, he, was, he was the centre. Um, maybe Ubis is coming close to, you know, look at that graph we're showing in the advert breaks. Um, you know, how Ubis hopping around from one place to the other for 365 days a year. But <laughs> um, Justin really was regarded as a centre there. He'd take all the code that was being submitted and harmonise it and things like that, from what I gather, not being a techie. Um, is there anybody you really feel, except maybe Ubis, um, who's performing a kind of function for all you devs in that regard these days? Being as those you are the ones doing it. Well, um, there obviously isn't. <laughs> right. And, and, and no one has stepped up. And, right. and you know, it's it's also part of the personal views. Uh, yeah. You know, in, in some sense, all of us, uh, the te all us tech people fall on the Asperger's spectrum somewhere. Um, yeah. And so, you know, having someone with good uh, people skills as well as, you know, organizational skills, the tech skills, that's a hard thing to do. And it's also a big commitment. It takes a lot yeah. of time. As, um, as he found out, yeah. It's a perfect match, though. Any, uh, any thoughts on that, Jay? The, the, uh, the, well, you don't want to name names either, I'm sure. So <laughs> we need somebody. Um, right, okay. Um, I'm getting all the alerts. So one minute left and everything else. So um, I think we'd better round up. 
Uh, that, thank um, um, uh, uh, Leah will take us out when I've rounded up. So um, basically, I'd like to um, thank you, Robert. Um, uh, so Robert Adams. Um, I don't know, other, uh, Mr. Blue, otherwise known as. That's it. Yeah. And uh, thanks to uh, Joe Magarak. I hope I've got that pronunciation right. And um, yeah, thank you both for being here. And um, yeah, I think this is where we close it. And uh, Leah takes over to do the uh, conference bit. Thank you, Mal. And thank you to Joe, Mr. Blue and Mal for a great panel and, and to our audience for the, the wonderful questions and thoughts about the future. Tomorrow, there'll be another panel session in the morning. So stay tuned for that. As a reminder to our audience, you will want to check out the conference.opensimilar.org to see what is coming up on the conference schedule. You won't want to miss our next session, which begins at 1.30 in this keynote region, and it's entitled Building Empathy in the Virtual World. We also encourage you to visit the OSCC 23 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the hypergrid resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with our sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our panelists and to you, the audience.